So, my name is Paul Ascanier. I work for the GData Security Labs, and more uh, specifically on malware analysis of uh, targeted attack or more or less every cool stuff. And uh, I'm not only malware analyst, I make some uh, private article about uh, radio frequency hacking or how to open a physical safe on the hotel when you are boring and this kind of uh, stuff. So I think everybody is wake up, everybody is ready. I am going to make a talk about one hour of assembly language. No, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to present it a few tools used by uh, what I call Euroboros actors. So it's more or less uh, the, the planning. So we work on this group since uh, more than one year, and we are able to create a kind of timeline of tool. We think it's developed by the same uh, guys or same groups. Why? Because sometimes they copy paste some part of code. They use some uh, same encryption, um, encryption keys, extra, extra. I will speak about uh, this fact after. So we are, I, I'm speaking about a group that started to work in 2006. So uh, I'm speaking about a group that worked basically since 10 years and uh, in offensive uh, topic. So uh, in 2006, uh, we found uh, something that called uh, Agent BTZ here. And a uh, few years after, they uh, make some evolution on it and uh, create something called Carbon. Or sometimes it's called Cobra. It depends on uh, which security company is speaking. W you will see it's really complicated because for same malware, generally we have at least five names. And Euroboros or Snake or Turla or extra, it's the same uh, sample. So I will present each project, functionality, how it works, extra, extra. And uh, at the end, I will speak about attribution because I must speak about attribution, but uh, we will see it's not so easy. So. The first case is Agent BTZ and Comrade. In fact, if you look here, it's for me the same malware, but uh, during the first year, the evolution was really uh, slow. It's only uh, patching and small features, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, in 2013, they changed uh, more or less half of the malware so that's why we decided to rename it, but it's really in the continuity. So here is a number of samples we identify during the last year. So we can see it was really used in 2007, and uh, the number of samples decreased, and it reappeared in 2012, and in fact it's the Comrade version of uh, the malware. Here I created a small uh, array to show you the evolution. So the percentage you can see is the difference between uh, two versions of the malware. Because in this case, developers put uh, a versioning on it. So I can easily say it's this version and uh, this one extra extra and make some bin diff between two versions. So we can see at the beginning the difference is 10% of the code is different, extra, extra. And here we have a big difference. 60% of the code is similar. It's uh, the switch from uh, Agent BTZ to Comrade with new functionality and uh, they change the compiler too. So if you change compiler, the binary will be different. That's why it's uh, so different. And after the percentage are really, uh, the difference are really small. So the 1.5 version uh, was used against US Pentagon in 2008, I think, something like that. You can read a lot of uh, paper about this topic. And here it's when uh, Agent BTZ became, from our point of view, uh, Comrade. So on few binary, not a uh, whole binary, we, the developers forgot to remove the compilation path so we can see the internal name of the project is uh, Chink, 
or Jinx 64 for 64 uh, bit version. So the feature of uh, this malware are really common. It allows you to uh, execute command, download file, upload file, etc., etc. All the requests are performed in HTTP. And on the first version of uh, Agile BTZ, the developers implement a uh, USB media in infection uh, thanks to the utterance enabled by default on Windows XP. So when an infected machine, uh, when someone connected a USB key on an infected machine, it automatically creates an utterance file. And when the USB key uh, was connected to another one, it was automatically executed and automatically installed. So uh, Microsoft removed this feature uh, on 7, and it's not enabled by default. So the developers decided to remove uh, this uh, functionality because it doesn't work anymore. So just for information, uh, for the US Pentagon case, if you read on the press visibly, uh, someone found the USB key on the, on the where they parked the car take it and plug it inside of the US Pentagon. And that's how the first infection uh, was uh, performed. So, on uh, the last version of um, Comrade, the developers implement a new trick to uh, become persistent, because of course every malware generally <laughs> want to start automatically on uh, the reboot of the system. We can use some tools like uh, sysinternals, autoruns, or, or, or other tool to list every program started at the when the system starts. And in this case, to not appear on the list of uh, executed program, the malware use com object. So in Windows, everything is com object. And they create a com object with the same name than an existing one. And uh, it's Thanks to this trick, when an application uses this legitimate COM object, it's not the legitimate code that is executed, but the DLL installed by uh, the attackers. So with this trick, for the moment, I didn't see any tools that list uh, COM object uh, created and COM object executed during the boot or during execution of legitimate binary, etc. Cetera, et cetera. In this case, they hijacked the uh, functionality used to increase the contrast of the window. Basically, it's not used by a lot of people, and they can hijack it, and if it doesn't work, it's not a big problem because nobody really uses it. Another interesting case on every sample from the beginning to today, it's always the same uh, XOR encryption key you can see there. So, and this key was used on every case, basically. So it was for the first one. The first one is really uh, simple to analyze. It's uh, old uh, product, and uh, it works in user land. It's create one thread, etc., etc. It's it's really they don't use a big uh, obfuscation, etc., etc. The second one, so created a few years after, is uh, Cobra or Finet. It depends which uh, company. And. This one is more complicated, and they use some uh, really funny tricks to uh, complexify the analysis and to complexify the detection of uh, the malware. For example, they use a legitimate file to uh, to set configuration. So on Windows system, you've got a uh, inf directory with a lot of uh, in file, and on one of these legitimate files, the malware had uh, a stanza with configuration. So you have this file, you must have this file, but you simply add at the top of the file its configuration. I in this case, uh, it's explained that the root directory of the malware is in uh, accessories uh, EN uh, US. And this directory is uh, generated uh, uh, randomly when the malware is installed. So on every machine you will have a different directory and on every machine a different inf file will be used to store this configuration. 
how this malware works. In this case, it's most, uh, more complicated. The, the malware is divided on three parts. You've got in one part uh, the orchestrator called system by the developers. And this one is uh, you stay in background and he used to uh, handle request. In the other part, you've got the payload. And this one is called user by the attackers. And it generates request to the orchestrator. The orchestrator handles the request and gives results to, uh, to the payload. So the design is more complicated. And they have a configuration file too to avoid uh, putting uh, configuration in the binary. So in this case, uh, they use uh, encryption to store configuration. And I copy here uh, an example of configuration. So you've got uh, object. It's simply an ID to identify the machine. You've got IPROC is uh, the processes list where the malware will be injected. In this case, the malware is injected into uh, Internet Explorer, Outlook, MSN, Firefox, Opera, and Chrome, every browser and uh, email client. And here you've got an exclusion list where the malware will not be injected. So the other part of the configuration concerning a network. So it's a command and control used by the malware. So here we've got four command and control. One is located in Iran and uh, one in France. And I don't remember for the other one, but it's not really important. So when the malware wants to exfiltrate data, he used randomly one of this uh, domain. And if the domain is down, it switched to another one. So basically, if you blacklist only one uh, domain, it's like if you do nothing. The other part of configuration is a transport protocol. It's how the orchestrator speak with the uh, payload injected into browsers. In this case, it uses a name pipe, and the name pipe name <laughs> is a com comnap here. And something really useful for analysts is they provide a versioning. So we are able to create timeline and to know which version is used, et cetera, et cetera. So for the system, so the payload injected, uh, no, for the orchestrator, it's free slash uh, 61. And for the payload, it's free slash 62. Yeah. Something really useful, too, from my point of view, they create a log file. So uh, it was encrypted, but once you decrypt it, you can have every action performed on the machine. Uh, typically, you've got a slide with the definition of each letter, but uh, you can see when the malware is started, stopping, etc., in which process it's injected. For example, here we can uh, see it's injected in explorer.exe. You can see uh, the web request here, for example. You've got web request can see when the malware is sleeping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, you can uh, trace all the activity, and you can uh, see when the malware was installed, because the most, uh, the oldest log is when the malware is installed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a more complicated design, but the purpose is exactly the same as previously code execution, file downloading, file uploading, and they have a plugin management system. So they are able to push library and, for example, to have, a, I don't know, a kilogram feature or to be able to switch on microphone. Or I don't know, everything is possible. And uh, they have an efficient plugin system. Yeah. So Cobra or carbon or whatever the name, is uh, what we call a userland-centric snake. Because we will see after the author often use an uh, image of snake to name uh, the malware. So in this case, we have two components that spoke together in userland, and one used to handle everything, and the second one used to exfiltrate data, used to uh, steal information in the browsers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The new, the last version we know about uh, 
this group is Uroboros snake or Turla uh, malware. In this case, it's always a snake, but in this time, they decided to switch from user land to kernel land. So the malware is not uh, running as previously uh, with uh, the user's context or stuff like that, but it's executed uh, in the driver as a, um, on the kernel uh, as a driver. And thanks to this uh, choice, they are able to make more interesting stuff. For example, they are able to hook to modify the behavior of internal function of Microsoft. They are able to create a DPI monitor. They are able to make some uh, filter on network to be able to catch directly information on the network flow, basically. And uh, to do that, they, they had to bypass some kernel protection uh, put in place by Microsoft, I will explain after. And uh, something fun, they use a virtual file system. So you cannot see it. Uh, it's not map on drive, but in fact, they have a NTFS file system mount in memory, and they are able to put file, get file, extra, extra, like a kind of SAS. So why Euroboros? Uh, it's a reference to a Greek work that it's a snake that eats uh, its own tail. It's like the draw. And it's a string hard coded on the binary. It's Uroboros got you. So it's a name chosen by developers. So the malware is uh, composed of two files the driver first, and a dot dead <coughs> that file, it's the virtual file system I mentioned before. It's an encrypted one. So just uh, some tricks they use uh, on kernel side. So first, they when the malware is loaded, the first thing they do is to remove the beginning of the binary. You can see uh, this program cannot be in DOS mode. So it's basically the beginning of the Windows binary. But at the beginning, you've got only zero here. They simply replace the beginning of the loaded driver by zero. Why? Because uh, I think if you we have people from incident response team here, you use often volatility, I think, to analyze memory dump. And typically, volatility is looking for the beginning of strings. He's looking for the MZ stuff. So if you use volatility on an infected machine, volatility uh, didn't see the loaded driver, because he's looking for the pattern of the beginning of the binary. And in this case, it's null, so he, the tool will never see uh, the loaded driver. So uh, after the publication uh, uh, we made about this topic, volatility patched the binary, and now he's able to detect it even if the beginning of the binary is uh, wiped in memory. Another trick, they use a pull tag ID uh, NTFS, and it's a legitimate pull tag ID used by the NTFS driver, the real one. And uh, WinDBG, for example, trust this file and say to you, oh yeah, this driver don't care about it, it's NTFS driver, simply because the author chose the same name. Yeah. So see if you, if you list every driver on the infected machine, you can see a driver with a name null. So it's our bad malware, uh, bad driver. And if you look every object link to this driver, you can see something called uh, FWPM callout. It's in fact a uh, network mini filter. I will speak about that after. And you can see how this one. How this one is uh, the part that uh, handles the virtual file system loaded in memory. So, one interesting thing is that the malware performs some hook on a uh, interesting internal function of Microsoft. To perform this task, the malware had an interruption at the beginning of function. For example, at the beginning of the IO create device function, you've got int uh, C3, 
and normally you don't have that. The malware modify the beginning of the function in order to generate an interruption and execute its own code instead of the legitimate one. So, well it's not really interesting. Here you've got the code of uh, the malware. I create a small Python script to list every uh, hooked function on an infected machine. I simply take every function and look if I've got a int uh, at the beginning. If I got this interruption at the beginning, it's a hooked function. It's not so complicated. And here you've got loss, uh, all function uh, hooked by the malware. So basically, the malware modifies the way of uh, how Microsoft uh, Windows and a registry process a driver, file, uh, file system, extract, extract, extract. So when you try to list file on a specific directory, Explorer asks to Windows what kind of file I've got here, and Windows automatically jump on the malware code. The malware code decided if he wants to show you or not the file in the directory, and go back to Explorer and you've got uh, the output. So basically, uh, I spoke about a virtual file system, a dot .dat file, and the hook function I use to uh, hide this file. If you go on the directory, you cannot see the file. Even if you use a process uh, uh, explorer or MS-DOS or what you wish, every tool will show you no file. It's the same for the registry used to automatically start uh, the malware to load the driver at the boot. It's the same thing. If you go on the registry and you see, uh, you try to see if the key is here, you will not see the starting key. And it's the same thing for a lot of stuff. So you cannot trust an infected system. You must take a memory dump and analyze the memory dump of the infected system on the clean system. So, what is the uh, Windows filtering platform? It's an uh, API provided by Microsoft to uh, creating network filter. In this case, the malware creates uh, a kind of uh, deep packet inspection and uh, he's able to sniff the network and looking for specific pattern. Yeah. For, for example, it was used on NamePipe and when a machine tried to connect to a name pipe uh, on the infected machine, the malware look at the network, and when he see a specific pattern, he say, oh, yeah, I've got an order, I need to do something. And uh, yeah, here it's uh, how the malware detects uh, the order. He's looking for a specific string in the network flow. If he has this specific string, he knows that I got an order after, and I need to do something. So it's completely passive. The malware don't ask order, he waiting to receive order. So the other interesting part is the virtual file system I mentioned. So the fun thing is it's mapped, it's mounted in memory. You cannot access it by uh, your uh, explorer but you can access it by MS-DOS. If you do dir space uh, backslash backslash dot backslash hd1 backslash, you can see all the files stored in the virtual file system in memory. So all the tools used by the attackers and temporary put in this virtual file system can be list uh, thanks to this trick. So on the case I worked on, I saw a Q file. I will mention after what is a Q file log file and additional tools such as uh, RAR to compress uh, data, uh, pass the hash tool, um, dump the hash tool, etc. Et so it's really a common reconnaissance tool. Yeah. So in the virtual file system, uh, I don't know if you can read, but you can see a Q file and a KT log file. It's the log file and the Q file. And the Q file uh, is encrypted too and contains uh, configuration 
CC configuration, for example, and it contains DLL. And in fact, the rootkit, the driver, does not directly communicate to internet. He injects a DLL in userland, in the browser typically, and this DLL in the browser will contact the CC on the internet. So it's the, ki it's the same um, kind of design that previously. Previously, we, we had an uh, orchestrator and payload, and we have exactly the same thing, but the orchestrator now is in kernel. So it's simply an uh, evolution of uh, Cobra. The design is uh, more or less the same. Yeah. So, yeah, the injected DLL on the browser is used like uh, a proxy, in fact. The kernel said to your browser to go to internet. Your browser receives a request and sends to the kernel the order or what he has to do. The DLL was named by uh, attackers inj for injection, uh, underscore snake, underscore uh, win32.dll, or win64, of course, uh, I copy past. And uh, the communication ca can be performed in HTTP, so it's directly uh, a web request uh, performed by the browsers, but uh, the communication can be performed thanks to SMTP, uh, uh, ping, etc., etc. So it's really modulable, and the attackers can configure how you want. So, I explained that it's a driver uh, loaded in memory that hook a function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, Microsoft did a lot of work to avoid uh, this uh, approach. So, directly, it's impossible to add the interruption uh, C3 at the beginning of the function. If you do that on Windows 7 64 bits, uh, the system crashed. Microsoft preferred to suicide your system than doing that. So normally, it's not possible to do that. In this case, uh, the malware simply uh, create hook before the hook control. So he modifies the behavior of the hook control that check if hook are performed. So he simply do the task before and it works. So he modifies the key uh, bug check x function to never say a hook is here. It always say everything is good, everything is good. It's a first trick. And they use another trick. On Windows 7 64 bit, directly, you are not able to load a not signed driver. If the driver is not signed, you cannot load it. But if you are developers, you are able to switch uh, your system in test mode and load your driver during development period, etc. Cetera, et cetera. If you do that on your Windows, it's uh, simply a, a command on MS-DOS, you will see at the uh, bottom right a message that's explained to you you are in testing mode. It's uh, the screenshot I put here. So if an attacker wants to load an unsigned driver, he must switch in test mode but uh, the user is able to see this text and say, oh, it's weird. Uh, normally, I'm not in test mode. Something is wrong. In this case, uh, the developers uh, use a trick and use a legitimate uh, driver to load the bad driver. So how they did that? VirtualBox released a driver, I don't know, uh, in 2008. So it's a really old binary. And uh, VirtualBox is a legitimate tool, and it's signed by the company that created uh, this tool. And of course, this driver can be loaded. But a vulnerability exists on this binary, on this old driver, and this vulnerability allows to switch to zero an arbitrary memory address. And what the attackers do? They decided to switch uh, the test mode to from 1 to 0. So they are looking for the address of uh, test mode enable yes, no. And they switch from yes to no. So And as the driver is signed and legitimate, the driver is able to do this task. And once they switch off the uh, 
signature enforcement, they are able to load the unsigned driver after. Yeah, here it's step by step. Uh, say load uh, virtual box driver, uh, use a symbolic link, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to switch off the signature enforcement. It's simply one line. Here it's how to do this task. It's simply one line of code to switch off uh, driver signature. Uh, something really interesting is uh, the virtual box driver is uh, presently expired. And it's expired since three years, something like that. But Microsoft doesn't support expiration of driver, of uh, certificate. So if you use certificate to sign driver and it's expired, it's no problem. Microsoft will load it. So it doesn't support uh, expiration date. So it's one point. And the other thing is I never saw company that revoke certificate in case of vulnerability. I never saw that. Usually uh, a company revokes certificate only when the certifi certificate is compromised, but not for each bug they had. And it's impossible to uh, deal with this ph philosophy. So basically it's another problem of the uh, certificate ecosystem from my point of view. So, and the stuff about uh, kernel um, mm, signing driver protection is the first time we saw this approach on this malware. It's a new, it was during uh, the analysis, a new trick. And the Euroboros case included uh, some other uh, exploit too. So they have uh, exploit to uh, have uh, administrator privilege to be able to install the driver typically. And uh, they include a lot of uh, exploit. So concerning the command and control, I saw two kind of CC. Dedicated server, from my point of view, only used by attackers to do the job and legitimate uh, compromised website. So, we have three kind of malware, three quality of malware, and how uh, the attackers work. Basically, they always work with the same approach. They start with uh, an exploit on a legitimate website, or spear phishing campaign to target uh, entities. The first uh, install malware is a reconnaissance tool called uh, with bot of Tav Tavdig. It's uh, really a not important malware. The purpose is simply to infect the machine, get information, and select if the machine is relevant or not. If the machine is not interesting, the malware is cleaned and the machine is okay. If the machine is interesting, at this time, the author switched to uh, a second malware. And the second malware is Cobra or Euroboros, depending of uh, customers or targets. And uh, for each infection part we saw, it's always the same uh, modus operandi. Uh, with but and Tavdig uh, is a typically to have information on the infected machine and to validate if it's an uh, interesting machine or not. So he take uh, OS, he take uh, host name, domain, because thanks to the domain, we basically know who is infected, because every company have a domain with the name of the company. It's the same for government, basically. Uh, they get time zone to be sure the guy is in the good time zone, extra, extra. Once uh, this first step is realized and they have access to a first machine, the next step is to compromise more machines infrastructure. And basically they compromise a lot of workstation and they compromised uh, internal server and they compromised a server or two uh, in border uh, directly connected to internet. Basically the server in border is um, HTTP server, a website, or exchange server. They compromise the exchange server and uh, to communicate to internet directly if they want because it's connected to internet. It's work as designed. 
In the case I saw the compromise server inside of the infrastructure was um, it, it were basically a sh a file sharing uh, server, Windows file sharing, because all the information, interesting information of company are located in file, s file um, share server. And on the internet part, you've got uh, CC uh, managed by the attackers. So once they have this infrastructure in place on the uh, targeted company, they use uh, classic uh, post-exploitation tools like Mimikatz. In fact, they take the source code of Mimikatz and add some feature as uh, encryption of output, etc., etc. So it's exactly the same code with some uh, uh, obfuscation and encryption feature. They use uh, pass the hash and pass the ticket tools. So at the beginning, they use pass the hash, but uh, due to new security on company, extra, extra, they switch to pass the ticket. So they use the Kerberos ticket on Microsoft to uh, bounce from a machine to another one. And uh, they use a custom PS exec binary that use the hash or the ticket to make remote connection on uh, other machine in the network. So, uh, something uh, interesting is uh, what kind of target uh, we have. So in 2008, we have US Pentagon. It's the first uh, publicly known target uh, by this group. So it's a Wikipedia article if you're interested. We published uh, Uroboros case in February uh, 2014. And uh, we simply said that uh, due to the complexity, we think it's uh, targeted really important company or entities or government because it's not a crimeware. Typically, it's too complicated. And two months after our publication, the Belgium Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, publicly announced they were compromised by Euroboros. In August, after our publication, Kaspersky published their own analysis of uh, what they call Epic Snake. And they mentioned that uh, this malware target government embassies, military research organizations, pharmaceutical group. And in September, uh, the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced that they were compromised by this uh, malware too. And we know a lot of other uh, targets and other compromised uh, entities or government, but it's not uh, publicly available, so I don't mention them. But visibly, the group targets a lot of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of a lot of different countries. So, attribution. And uh, I suggest to come uh, to um, our uh, uh, talk with uh, Joanne. I don't know if it's today or tomorrow. I don't. Today, okay, because we will speak about attribution and why it's uh, not so easy. So, during uh, analysis, we found uh, usage of same encryption key, same file name, uh, some malware. Uh, Euroboros check if uh, Adjump BTZ is installed before installing itself, extra, extra. So we have strong link between each sample. And on one or two samples, uh, the developers, we think, forget to remove uh, the language used by the compiler. And the language used by compiler uh, was Russian. And uh, another thing is the username of developers. Uh, we found Vlad, Yurik, uh, Gilg. Uh, I don't know. I, I know we have a Russian guy. Maybe it will ring a bell for him. <laughs> and uh, but as always, it's easy to modify a username. And tomorrow I can uh, make program with a Vlad username. So. In uh, 2011, a journalist from Reuters uh, write an article about the compromission of US Pentagon, and he writes that the US government strongly suspects that the original attacks was crafted by Russian intelligence. So it's confirmed what we expect. 
And it was the same thing for the Belgium case. Um, journalist in Belgium uh, explained that uh, it's probably a Russian route uh, to, to this case. So thanks for your attention. Uh, it's everything for me. If you have questions, feel free to ask.